really before we even begin, I can talk a little bit about some of the problems you're going to face coming back into a painting. As I've started to oil this picture out, what you'll notice is that the oil is actually pebbling up on the surface. This is because the substrate, essentially the oil painting that exists there now on top of the ground that I painted on, does not have a very porous surface, so there's nowhere really for the oil to go, so it's being resisted by that surface. This really is only a small problem in the sense that I understand that I'm going to actually paint over the picture right now, and so the absorption of that oil, for me, at least for my purposes in this moment, is not something that needs to be complete or perfect, it just needs to give me a general idea of the values that were there when the painting was wet, so that when I re-block in the painting, I have a set of colors and values that are relatively close to where the, the grisaille's values were. Starting out, I'm going to mix up a shadow color value, meaning that uh, just an average color that I'm going to use in the darker areas of my painting. I want it to be something that actually is very much in the higher key version of what my shadows will be in this painting, which is to say that I want to leave room to have a kind of darker accent in the color of my shadow or the color and value of my shadow. And if I start out with a shadow that's too dark, that's going to mean that I, I don't really have any more room to go darker. My general philosophy about painting in oil and painting portraits, still lives, etc., is that I try to work kind of from the middle out, meaning that I don't go at first for the extremes of value. Especially not when it comes to the shadows within the face. So I'm just going to start the process of kind of re-blocking in, though I do want to kind of test out and see what my value is in relationship to what's already on the canvas. You can see here, maybe that's just a little bit too light. I need to push that slightly darker. Now, the risk that you can take in pushing something darker is that, of course, you have to add black and that can become um, or can create a mixture that is a little bit too neutral. So I want to take a little bit of my alizarin to kind of warm up that shadow. Now remember, the reason you have two different reds on your palette here is not just because of their hue or the, the difference in their, their visual, kind of the appearance of their color, it's also their value. You can see that the vermilion is a very high key red. I mean, this is uh, on a value scale of kind of 1 to 10. You know, this is like a 5 or a 4 perhaps. And so when I add this into my mixture here, it's going to create a much lighter color value. So if I want to warm up my shadow, I'm more likely to use uh, this alizarin if I don't want to actually lighten it up a little bit. So just a tip in terms of like how you're going to use your, uh, your palette there. And this goes down to also, there's always a lot of conversation about, you know, understanding the extent or the limits of your palette and what you can do with it. For me, this falls into that category of you needing to understand like what you can do with a particular set of color values. So I think I have something now that is just a little bit darker, kind of suits my purposes just a little bit better. I think that's more what I'm looking for than, uh, than what the previous color value was. And I'm going to start by just kind of reestablishing some of the some of the shapes, especially of shadow in this, which are going to have to be converted from a grisaille coloration into color. Now, I'm going to be, I think, relatively kind of careful about how I block this in. Uh, part of the joy of having painted in, this in grisaille is that you then have this really fantastic kind of template underneath that you can kind of follow that will, uh, that will lead to a very orderly kind of process in painting. Now, if um, like a lot of you, if you have some experience oil painting out there, you'll know that like painting in oil, that painting in oil is not always really uh, something that is very orderly. It usually, it can become a little bit chaotic. And so it's a, a great benefit if you can manage to kind of keep 
your oil painting quite well organized. It's not always possible about where it is. I think especially for a student, it can be quite important. I mean, you see a lot of painters out there that kind of push the boundaries, push the limits of organization in, uh, in painting. They start out with these big, chaotic, uh, bold brush strokes and it all looks very cool, and it is. <laughs> I'm not going to dispute that, uh, that it looks very cool. However, I think as a student, a lot of times the passionate romantic start can lead to uh, maybe a little bit of a, I don't know, um, less pleasing middle period where you're trying to kind of make up for some of the chaos that you started out with. Again, not that it can't be done. Um, I don't ever really want to give you all like a binary advice like you can do this, you cannot do that. It's more you want to consider how and why you're doing something. You see how it can have a really actually quite nice effect as you're blocking this in. You get these really kind of warm shadow tones inside this overall kind of cooler painting. It uh, really has a kind of a resonant appearance. And that's something that, you know, in a way you want to, you want to kind of encourage, you want to work with that because, you know, color is something that it's so important that it has like a reaction, like kind of a call and response almost. Because we all know that warm colors on their own, well, maybe I say we all know, <laughs> Let's introduce the idea. Warm colors on their own are not enough to make a painting feel vibrant. You need a cool color in order for them to have a kind of uh, a counterpoint or a complementary color to make them appear as vibrant as they should. And so what you're seeing right now in the painting is this really interesting vibration in between warm and cool temperatures. And it's something that uh, as the painting progresses, of course, we're going to try to uh, actually maintain that sense of like vibrance that we're getting now. I'm also not like really killing the surface with color here uh, or, or with paint quantity. Uh, you can, of course, like paint more thickly or more thinly as you please. Uh, but for me, especially like in shadow areas, I try and keep it generally like a little bit thinner. Not, not in like a way that um, indicates, you know, some proper definition of like what shadow is by saying, oh, the shadow is thinner and the light is, is thicker. It's more just in terms of like, I don't really need to produce a lot of a lot of paint there, so I'm just not going to do it. It's kind of more like a I'm looking to not waste any motion uh, um, in my process, and that is my motivation. Like in areas like these, and then I'll probably uh, indicate eventually some of the lighter areas with a little bit more texture. You can see also though that. I've applied a lot of texture also in the grisaille, and so I have this advantage at the moment of already having uh, some of that intensity in the lights that, that eventually I, I want to have. Some of the body, right? Uh, we talk about, you know, lights being opaque and shadows being transparent and uh, you know, this is that dichotomy in action here. You know, as much as possible, and you know, because you've kind of been going through this process with me, as much as possible, I try to compartmentalize these things, right? To make it so that we can look at value in one moment, chroma in another moment, hue in another moment. But there will come a time in painting for sure where you simply have to get everything up in the air and kind of roll with it, which is terrifying. <laughs>
Uh, but we do it, right? That's painting. And that's why you do your studies. That's why you do your practice. So when the time comes that you need to improvise, that you're not left wondering what to do, you're quite well prepared for it. I've got this rather tricky highlight on the chin. It's generally something that gets overstated. We want to make sure it's light, but not so light that it pretends to be a part of the lights in this area, those being the most intense of the highlights available. So we try to brighten it in its own context, but not to overstate it. That's the struggle. By the way, I've just taken the highlight mixture that I had, that I was using down here, and I'm painting it into the lightest area, and what it really is in that area is kind of a darker half tone. Just interesting to kind of point out the interrelationship of these colors and values. You know, it is so much about context, the way that we perceive them. You can see how alien this side looks now. <laughs> it looks totally separate from anything that we're thinking about. The time will come, though, that we address it, that we get to get to a place where that is harmonious as well. The time isn't now. <laughs> More to go before we get there. Yeah, these long-haired combers are really a blessing at this time. So they let you change and tickle a little bit the surface without wholesale, like without wholesale disruptions to color and value in that area.
I think though that that's where I have to call it quits for today. I think that my level of focus, as I've noticed uh, over the hours, has started to diminish and I'm going to say that good work done for the moment and I'm going to continue the block in at a later date when I think I'm ready to do it the right way. And this is something, by the way, that I always take into my paintings and I take into consideration in my process. Am I going to be doing focused work? Am I going to be doing good work or just work? There's a huge difference in between the two when you're painting. One can result in meaningful progress and another can actually push you in the opposite direction. So better than just being in front of my easel and not totally 100% invested, I'll go off, take a break, wait for the painting to dry, and then continue when my mind is ready to 100% commit.